Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to, to you all to the second lecture in the RCSI Bahrain History of Medicine webinar series. So today we're very honored to uh, have a presentation by Professor Jim Dornan titled The Fall and Rise of Women. This will be followed by a question and answer session uh, moderated by Professor Tom Walsh. So uh, it is my great pleasure now to introduce Professor Jim Dornan, who is the head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology here at RCSI Bahrain. Space really does not permit me to mention the numerous qualifications and distinguished accolades that Professor Dornan has achieved in a most successful career to date. But briefly, he is not only the head of the department here at RCSI Bahrain, but remains the chair of the Health and Life Sciences at the University of Ulster, Northern Ireland. He is the Emeritus Chair of Fetal Medicine at Queen's University, Belfast. He is past Senior Vice President of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, past President of the Ulster Obstetrical Society, past Vice President of the Ulster Medical Society, past Global Fellow of the Council of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. He is a retired consultant in obstetrics and gynaecology at the Royal Maternity Hospital and Regional Director of Maternity Medicine in Northern Ireland. He maintains an active research in establishing the role of antenatal Doppler ultrasound to detect and reduce the incidence of stillbirth in South Africa. Without further ado, I give you Professor Jim Dornan. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Um, well, I've certainly been looking forward to this evening, especially after Prof John's wonderful start last week when he talked about medical practice through the ages. And I think those of you who were tuned in will realize that it was medical practice through the ages uh, practiced by men. And the place of woman was as a, a patient, 50%. Uh, and so tonight, I think I would like to do like a CPC, a clinical pathological conference on the place of women in society over the last 60,000 or 6,000 years, depending on what you believe in. So we're going to, like any good doctor, we're going to take a good history, carry out an examination, do relevant investigations, and find out what really is the cause of women's journey over the last millennia. Okay, so that's it. So I leave that slide up. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Nevin, um, so this evening we will monitor the fall and rise of women. We are now are aware of the, all of us are aware of the Me Too movement. Let's see why it was and is needed. At the start of the last century, the infamous psychiatrist, so this slide will, will, will Sigmund Freud asked, woman, what does she want? In his book, The Psychical Consequences of the Anatomic Distinction Between the Sexes, he stated oratively, women oppose change, receive passively, and add nothing to their own. Well, if you don't listen to them and treat them as chattels, then you're probably spot on. Some 20 years ago, I had occasion to speak on the same bill as his nephew, Dr. Elliot Phillip, he who wrote the history of obstetrics and gynae, along with our own colleague, Dr. Michael Dowd, seen here. He shared many insights of the great man, Uncle Sigmund. For example, the night before he himself wed, he went to see him and asked him, how long should the sex act last? To which Freud said, why are you marrying a cuckoo clock? But even since the time of Freud, women still find themselves in a depressingly low place, even in the greatly resourced world. And yet, at the start of the human female story, women were right up there. Let's see what happens since those heady days. Certainly the journey is far from over. I was just reading that in 2020 in Europe, 10 million women were domestically abused. 80% of companies, men were still paid more than women. Women only made up 23% of core STEM occupations of science, technology, engineering and math. Women employed in just 32% of civil service positions in government. And globally, 62 million girls 
are being denied education. Perhaps it was about 100,000 years ago we started leaving Africa, and 70,000 years ago we began communicating with speech and language. And this journey for us all started in Maropeng, one hour from Johannesburg. I must say, having discovered South Africa in the mid 90s, I've been a regular visitor since and always experienced this feeling of returning to my roots when the plane lands. Of course, it all started with a kiss, but hey, if it hadn't been for kissing, it wouldn't be here this evening, would we? None of us. So first of all, it was the apes. And then we started in Ireland, as just about anywhere else, there's often another man involved and quite often the church in the background as well. Invariably, without any preventative action by either party, fertilization occurs. The apes were first, they showed the way, but we caught up and though we uh, perhaps didn't take enough advice from our possible ancestors as to when to start and when to stop, our efforts, our, our efforts, we got to where we are today. I say perhaps, for there are those who believe that we humans didn't evolve over tens of thousands of years ago, but rather popped up de novo about 6,000 years ago. Many believe in creationism, and this museum in Kentucky is a monument to those of that persuasion. But there's not a lot of evidence out there supporting creationism. In pagan and pre-religious times, this early sculpture, the Venus of Willendorf, depicting the finer features of woman, was found 30 meters above the river Danube in Austria. It's 30,000 years old. Explain that to a creationist. When I visited Somaliland in 2006, I was taken to this site, just outside Hargeisha, and was shown these 28 to 30,000 year old examples of caval art. So either the cattle used to be skilled in artwork, or indeed we have been on a journey. A journey of evolution, which many believe may be nearing a halt because of our ability to encourage breeding between the imperfect who have had their imperfections medically or surgically corrected. On this journey, Early women and men must have been hugely impressed, frightened even, and in total awe of the weather, the wind, fire, the amazing cloud formations, lightning bolts, thunder, earthquakes. It is written in all three Abrahamic books that God created the heavens and the earth. Before, but before those books were written, it is no wonder that the human population of the world wondered what forces, what spirits, what gods are responsible for this? No wonder the people feared, worshipped these gods, while at the same time having special reverence for the constancy of sunrise, sunset and the seasons. Many were polytheistic, original paganism. Of course, if you spend your life under the elements, you're some bound to be in fear and reverence of something. Gia, for many tens of thousands of years, was the one goddess that was feared, revered, and worshipped. Mother Earth, Gia, give her a seed, and she produced the miracle of life. So why wouldn't you worship such a force? And so for most of our human history, for tens of thousands of years, matriarchy ruled. Women ruled the world, okay? Women were worshipped everywhere. Isis was the goddess from Egypt, who was worshipped as the patroness of nature and magic, as well as the ideal mother and wife. She was a friend of slaves, sinners, artisans, and the downtrodden. But she also listened to the prayers of the wealthy young maidens, rich aristocrats and rulers. Having been first worshipped in ancient Egyptian religion, later her worship spread throughout the Roman Empire and the great Greco-Roman world continuing until the suppression of paganism in the Christian era. Basically, men got fed up worshipping a woman. Meanwhile, in Ireland, we too were pagan and for quite some time. This is Danu, the mother of the Irish goddesses 
and the fairy people. She was known for her wisdom, wealth and abundance as far as Eastern Europe, all the way to Ireland. Ireland was the only Celtic speaking country not invaded by the Romans, only started writing material down in the 8th century. But even though we fell to Christianity, we were pa patriots who truly loved our past. Elements of paganism, magic, giants, mermaids and so on. Indeed, gods and goddesses were represented as human with human with special abilities. The Thuidae Danon, the peoples of the goddess Danu, were the nation with magical powers and sorcery, some would say to this day. And of course, we have to mention our very own Maeve, she who intoxicates, the Queen of Connacht, all powerful, intelligent, brave and majestic. In the early years of the last millennium, St. Patrick and Christianity were still some way away. Two powerful women, though, who put a lot of men through their hands. In the pre-Abrahamic generations, communications depended on the realities of its time, sculpture and art. There being no Instagrams, mobile phones, never mind Kodak. And the pharaohs and Egyptian artists in pagan, matriarchal, pre-religious times, some three to four thousand years ago, represented a man and woman as dignified, clothed and of equal status, both sitting quietly and with dignity. In these heady days, women were as high as they were ever going to reach. The last time the scales were in their favour, 2,700 years ago in the Arabian Gulf, 1,200 years ago in Ireland. Three Abrahamic religions then, over a couple of millennia, came into being. Three and a half thousand, two thousand, and one point four thousand years ago. All three in turn, believing they were the one true church, but all three demoting the role of woman to spouse. This move has been accredited to Judean, Hebrew, and Greek religious men, mainly from the East, from the stands, who divided the Mother Earth Goddess Gia into five minor goddesses, but more importantly, keeping just one male god. Women's place in society was slipping. Now started the fall of women, and this led to a key battle. Matriarchy or matrilinearity, or patriarchy and patrilinearity, and a key decision for the early church. Surprise, surprise, declared the winner by the Abrahamic religions, it was patriarchy. And so we've had two or three thousand years of a patriarchal experiment. And so following tens of thousands of years of paganism and goddess worship, the natural state was destroyed by men who subjugated women by introducing patriarchy, men ruling the world. And since religion was used to change the balance of power, it is only right that we reflect on that two or three thousand years of patriarchy. But perhaps a good time to remember that in the Bible, one of the three books, in the book of Revelations, on the final day, it says, you shall be called by the name of your mother. Interesting. So that was it. And the church in Europe continued this patriarchal approach and celibacy being introduced in the 11th century and put into canon law 100 years later by Pope Benedict XV. And why was it introduced? Land ownership, money. The church didn't want widows having rights to church land after the demise of the priests. It was not to keep priests pure. And patriarchy, that brings with it all of these. Abuse, objectification of women, unrealistic standards of beauty, rape culture, male-dominated industries, professions and politics, gender stereotypes, negative female portrayals, unequal pay, the list goes on. Life at the top didn't last that long. What has happened? Men happened. In 1884, a particularly difficult time for women, Friedrich Engels, a German philosopher, 
In his book, written in conjunction with Karl Marx, The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, reminded us that this demotion of the role of woman was a deliberate act as an integral part of patriarchy. Keep her down and keep her poor has been the message ever since. But the church continued to be frightened of women. They still are. Remember Mr. and Mrs. Pharaoh, pre-700 BC? So before religious times, this was soon replaced. Where the submissive, subservient spouse stands reverently at the side of her overlord who sits. Woman, with the onset of religion, and I mean all Abrahamic religions, have become the dutiful wife and housekeeper. No more the strong, equal, intelligent miracle of life maker, but now objectified. There was and represented by the artists of the time, often as an object of beauty and lust. The artists, of course, were paid by those with the money, the men, as he who pays the piper picks the tune. There were no Bailey, Arbus, Kappa, Leibovitz or Sherman. Note the use of marble to reflect the smoothness of the skin. Women were increasingly depicted as naked, erotic, bathing, and were the servants of men. Look around you next time you go to a European art gallery. With the establishment of the mainstream religions, women were now depicted as the mothers of God. An artist used the woman, for example, as a frame for their baby boy, Jesus. What had happened? Men had happened. Simple as that. Well, men had happened and it has to be said, Hinduism is the only act of religion where the woman is still worshipped as a goddess. It is the only living religion where God is he and she from the start until today. Though I will give it to Islam, the name Allah is genderless. Yet I am pretty sure that most tuning in tonight were brought up to refer to God as he. The translators of the Torah, the Bible and the Quran have a lot of explaining today to do. Yes, this evening I want you to go away thinking, not thinking, go away thinking I'm not, I'm not condemning any particular religion. But I admit I am fully and completely condemning the way many men have manipulated religions for their own ends, their own powers, and I would suggest to hide their own insecurities. And to this day all over the world, men run the big institutions. Incredibly, this is a group totally of men planning Trump healthcare for women. Amazing, isn't it? And we were in Japan for the World Cup last year, or two years ago, another country with a long, long history where women have a problem dealing with the past and the present. Shinto and Buddhism are the main religions, and even Shinto believes that women are the devil and are only purified when they marry and symbolically have their horns covered. Never mind us, I've walked two daughters and a sister down the aisle. I thought I was trendy not asking my wife to say I promised to obey. But I mean, there I was standing and the minister saying, who giveth this woman? Giveth? What was I at? What were they at? There is no doubt who is pulling the swings, who are pulling the strings, and have been for the last two and a half to three thousand years. The wages of sin are death, certainly the ease of sin. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? Because thou hast done this, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In pain and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, because before that childbirth was pain free. So there you go. Let's blame Eve. Like most religions, they all blame Eve. Almost all paintings of Eve portray her as naked, showing that while her nakedness is tolerated by men, her thoughts and feelings are irrelevant. She was created second to Adam and was responsible for original sin. Women were untrustworthy and dangerous and were only complete once she became a mother. Around 600 AD, the established Orthodox Church was very corrupt. A common man spent his whole rather short life raising money to give to the priest 
to try and ensure a good place in heaven. Indeed, it was this very corruption that led to the foundation of Islam in a response. And by the 14th century, although it did herald the Renaissance and the flowering of literature, art and science, key Renaissance men were Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, who hated each other, by the way. Many of their paintings portrayed women as objects of theory and study. But hey, women were beginning to seek life outside the kitchen, and that wasn't appreciated by the church. The 16th century brought us the Baroque period of Rubens and Rembrandt, and artists were still being paid for their work by the courts, the big houses, and the powerful all-male dominated. Hence the art of the day, including those painted by the old masters, often portrayed fully dressed men and naked voluptuous women. Women were shown as provocative, erotic and sensuous playthings. The works oozed sexuality and definitely women's bodies were sexualized and objectified. Certainly little subtlety as to the role of women in society being shared by these artists. So next time you see these type of paintings on your travels, just remember they reflected what men wanted them to reflect. By now women were gaining speed, but downwards. The 18th century, nature lovers, herb growers and witches which is, by the way, were simply educated women, were burnt alive all over Europe by the established church in what was called the Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches. 80,000 women burnt. Being a law-abiding Christian woman has certainly some interesting consequences in the Middle Ages, and midwives were included amongst the women who fell foul of the church. Why? Because they helped mothers deal with the discomfort of childbirth rather than leaving them to suffer the way the church had decreed was their destiny, their lot. By the early 17th century, Rubens seems to have experienced a sort of road to Damascus experience. He had become a leading member of the Catholic Church. His dad was a Calvinist, his mother a Roman Catholic, and he became a leading member of the Catholic Counter-Reformation style of painting, saying, my passion comes from the heavens, and not from earthly musings. Here is a self-portrait of his wife. His wife is sitting beautiful and modestly dressed, but sitting below Rubens, her master. Rembrandt, the true master of the Baroque, was commissioned by the Protestant church to illustrate the Protestant ethic of work, prosperity, and a stable home. Here we see the husband very busy solving some scientific and technical problem while his wife is seen as a willing and subservient helper, perhaps showing him a list of goods to purchase at Lulu on his way back from the golf club. By the 19th century, men dominated Europe. Patriarchy was at its peak and women were in their place. Typical was Sir Edward Jenner, he of smallpox and typhus fame. He said, rather than see my daughter sit at a dissecting table as a medical student, I would prefer to see her dead before my eyes. But remember, Newton's third law, reaction. So by the mid 19th century, women were beginning to use their beauty and then their brains. They were becoming more powerful by making men want them and not just use them. Integral to the great 19th century revolution, was the demolition of the hedonist patriarchal society in the resourced world, at least. At least. Delacroix epitomized this in his 1830 painting, Liberty Leading the People, with our female leader as a working class Parisian revolutionary with a flag in one hand and a musket in the other. The 19th century brought us a large collection of great female writers, Alcott, Austin, Nightingale, Bronte, many more. Game on, patriarchy, watch out. Women were on the rise at last. But, and there's always a but, in the first half of the 20th century, 
World Wars I and II held back progress of women's rights, apart from the wonderful work of the suffragettes. Both wars being initiated by testosterone-driven little men. Women helping in their part by the 20th century, playing a little part in the Second World War, taking photographs, pulling down air balloons and making parachutes, women's work. So hooray for Germaine Greer. At last, back 60 years ago, she decided to make her life's work to try once more to get women back to where they had been. And she has started a process, but the journey is far from over everywhere. And chauvinism is still to be found at all levels of society. These changes, slow as they were, have been definitely too much for Afghanistan. In the 70s, it could have been downtown Dublin or London. Not now, though, for the battle has been two steps forward, one step back, and sometimes three steps back. But I am delighted to report to you that women being educated in that country has gone from 1 million 15 years ago to 20 million now. So watch this space. Women were on the rise, sorry. Women were on the rise and they were on the comeback trail. At least when I say that, most women were on the rise. Let me ask you all a simple multiple choice question. What do the following have in common? And while considering your answers, please remember two thirds of the world is under resourced. Failing to be born because of your gender, having your genitalia removed by a sharp stone at the age of eight, forced into marriage at first menstruation, non-consensual sex from your first encounter, no access to contraception, forced to abort their girl fetus, often destined to die in the corner of a field, guilt-ridden, infected and lonely from unsafe home abortion, to be one of 50% of women in the world who have no antenatal care, to, up, to have up to one in eight chance of dying before during pregnancy in, in Afghanistan because of rickety pelvises due to lack of sunlight, dying 12 hours after convulsing continuously during labour for the lack of exposure to magnesium sulphate, which, cheap, which is cheaper than table salt, dying from uncontrollable bleeding just after you have given birth to the beautiful baby you always long for, dying after 72 hours of hard labour but failing to deliver due to the immaturity of your pelvic development, being considered by your husband and family to be guilty of adultery because you have not delivered by sunset, being constantly wet with urine leakage as a consequence of obstructed labour, suffer from constant physical and mental abuse and considered to be of less value than a domestic farm animal? Well, sadly in all parts of the world, the answer is all of the above only happen to women. How did you do in the test? And are silently happening to a lot of women a lot of the time. A mixture of man and nature is a heady mix indeed. There is of course nothing as beautiful as nature at her best and nothing as frightening as nature at her worst and nothing can go so fast from one to the other. Indeed, perhaps the same can be said of man. About 20 years ago, Newsweek at last informed the rest of the world of the terrible physical price many women are paying day and daily. When it asked what kills most women every minute of every day, heart attacks, AIDS or childbirth? The answer, childbirth. And the appalling maternal mortality in the under-resourced worlds were being taken seriously. I became senior VP of RCOG with a job to set up the international office. I saw and heard of many harrowing situations, but I think the worst I heard was that in many places of the world, that it is sadly cheaper to let the wife die and replace her with a new one than pay for a cesarean. And of course, up until the middle of the 20th century, it was the same for us. This death certificate form from 100 years ago includes both the mother and the newborn. The doctor writes, I attended the deceased 
the 15th of July, 1912, to the 22nd of July, 1912. Peripheral, peripheral peritonitis, childbed fever. However, at least the end of World War II saw the beginning of the end of the wholesale loss of maternal death in the UK, Ireland, USA, and Nordic countries, thanks to blood transfusions, antibiotics, and eventually safe cesarean sections. The Taj Mahal was built by one man, Shah Jahan, the Emperor of India. He took the death by hemorrhage of his beautiful wife, Megum Mahal, mother of his 14 children, so deeply that he built this beautiful um, building in her memory. The United Nations realized that prioritizing child and maternal mortality in its Millennium Development Goals, and by pledging to reduce death by 2015, that we could make things a bit more equal worldwide. In the RCOG, we were told to address Millennium Goals 4 and 5, reduce mortality and improve maternal health. It didn't take long for me to realize that 4 and 5 is not the real problem. The problem was solve 3, empower and educate women, and they will save themselves. By empowerment, we mean maternal necessities, food and clothes, control over lives, political empowerment, having a voice. So yes, the Millennium Development Goals were great in that they included maternal mortality, universal education and health, and so focused the attention of the world in achieving some goals. But no, they were silent on women's security and dignity. They were silent on the violations of women's health rights, including gender-based violence. They were silent on the need to uphold women's reproductive and sexual rights. Sexual and reproductive rights, and there is a list of them. I have to be honest and say that the US have been uh, one of, if not the biggest donor to sexual and reproductive health worldwide, but sadly not consistent. And the tap gets turned on and off every eight years, depending, which is incredibly frustrating and difficult for healthcare providers at the gold face. The good news is, though, that Honest Joe turned the tap back on two weeks ago, four years to the day after Trump turned it off. As I say, America, one of the largest donors in terms of dollars and man, woman power of the world effort to address the great divide in healthcare provision, along with the UK, Holland, Canada, France. During my time, though, one person I came to appreciate immensely was Melinda Gates. She had to do some serious thinking the more she got involved in the whole area. But she did, and for the greater good. A tough journey for a good Catholic girl to walk, but she has walked it. Let's lighten the mood for one slide. I just had to show you I had to go to Nigeria to get a picture of SIP seven happy midwives in one picture. So the second rise for a woman has been a struggle and the journey is far from over. However, for one woman who walked the journey and on her own two feet was Joy Darling. She delivered me. And yes, related to Michael Darling, the sadly recently deceased past master of the Rotunda in Dublin. She went to this university, Queen's University in Belfast in the north of Ireland, which in 1863, along with all universities in the Celtic Islands and governed by Britain, banned women for 20 years. Men were so frightened of educated women. Fascinating, isn't it? But slowly things started to improve from 1885. For 20 years later, this is a picture I saw in a friend's house of Queen's University Literific Society. And you see there were two women in it. The woman in the front on the left, she looked after the uh, pounds, shillings and pence, the money in those days. And look at the woman on the right, the very intelligent, highly educated daughter of the um, headmaster of one of the biggest schools in Ireland. Well, she was the presidential ashtray bearer. But there were some women doctors from Ireland. Dr. Barry cracked it back in the early 19th century by living as a man. Born in Ireland and Cork, wanted to become um, 
uh, a doctor, but was actually Margaret Ann Buckley. An eventual autopsy showed that he was a woman, worked in Cape Town and performed the first cesarean in Africa where mother and baby both survived. Between 1880 and 1920, 759 matriculated and 452 got degrees. That's 11 a year. When I've read this book, I'll come back next year and tell you more about it. But one I have to tell you about is Dr. Emily Winifred Dixon. She ruled, enrolled at RCSI at the age of 21 after nursing her mother for a year. Her dad supported her. She wanted to follow her brother and attend Trinity in Dublin, and the medical faculty wanted her. But guess who said no? The Church of Ireland theologians said no, but RCSI said yes. So she was the only woman in her year. Well done, RCSI. She went on to marry and have five kids, and she too supported the suffragettes. This is her operating at the Richmond, now the Bowman. All anti-vaxxers with no masks, I see. And Ireland has also produced against the odds. And Ireland has also produced against high odds wonderful scientists, an Irish astrophysicist who discovered pulsars, which are rapidly spinning neutron stars, in 1967. 24-year-old PhD student, and seven years later, her supervisor, male of course, and another male astronomer got the Nobel Prize for Physics. But 50, more than 50 years later, this portrait of her was unveiled at the Royal Society of Medicine in London. Wonderful world-class leaders, like one of our Irish past presidents, Mary, the Irish woman who became the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in 1997, a task she performed with assured aplomb. Another past president of Ireland, and a woman who performed the opening ceremony of RCSI, Bahrain, in 2009. Wonderful world-class academic in canon law who hasn't been afraid to take the theologians on. After 227 years, she was the first female recipient of an honorary doctorate in 2010. But hey, is any of this a surprise? Look at the four great institutions of our time, whether in Ireland or anywhere else politics, medicine, the law, or the church. They are all 80 to 90% male inhabitants, every one. Imagine, just for a moment, that they were 90% female, and that these were worldwide, and they were responsible for men's sexual and reproductive health rights. Wouldn't that be a laugh? Next slide. As Kamala Harris asked Brett Kavanaugh, can you think of any laws that give the government the power to make decisions about the male body? His reply, no, I can't. I just love beer myself. Women, human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights, once and for all, as Hillary Clinton said. Meanwhile, while falling and rising, there have been many societal changes. Definitely women are living longer. This was a church party of a friend of mine's father with 90 years, invited all the 90 year olds to come along one Saturday afternoon. 95 were just four men. And in fact, if you look at the one on the left, on the extreme left, he wasn't even there by sunset. Women are changing, that's just a fact. And quite simply, their perception has to become our aim. And their OBGYN has changed too, and not just the way they look. In the past, all male. In the present, and in a lot of Europe, all female. Hopefully, we will have a balance in the future. So, in the good old days, in the good old days, many colleagues said that we gynees only had three procedures. Scrape it out, take it out, and paint it blue. The good news is 
that we now understand the control tower, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And at last, we have the endocrine armamentarium to manipulate that very cycle. And some of you may ask, is that interfering with nature? And I hope in a few slides, I will be able to reassure you that it is not. I would like to talk you through, okay? But meanwhile, relax. We don't operate on the control tower. Gynies aren't going to become brain surgeons, I promise you. You know, in the past, we had the problems of having children, abortion, miscarriage, pelvic floor, prolapse, cancer of the cervix was everywhere when I started. And now we have the problems of not having children, contraception, infertility, menstrual cycle issues, PMT, polycystic ovaries, endometriosis, and cancer of the ovary. And we only found out recently the cancer of the ovary invariably is a secondary to when the primary was in the fallopian tube. Think of all the gynecologists throughout the world over the past decades who, having done a hysterectomy, left the tubes behind thinking, I don't need to go in after them. So it has certainly been an interesting journey for us all over the years. Next slide. Now, I hope this works nicely. I want you to look at what is physiologically required of three very different groups of women. OK, hunter gatherers of that Kalahari desert, the Hutterites, fundamental brethren who, who started at the Reformation. They're similar to the Amish and the Mennonites. And then I want you to compare it with the contemporary women of the resourced world. So let's just look at the reproductive performances of these three populations. Anyway, these are the Hutterites. Uh, let's look at them. They're a bit like us uh, physiologically. So they have their first, uh, they have their first uh, monarchy at the age of 12 because they're, it's a bit like the, the, um, the, uh, in the resourced world. So after the monarchy, they have a period of adolescent sterility cultural infertility, then they get married because they're good Mennonites and they have a baby, but they want a lot of other Hutterites, so they don't breastfeed for long and they have a baby every other year. So by the time they get into their 40s, they've had 11 children and they have breastfed them all, but a short period of time. The Kung Hunter gatherers, by the way, they had just five children and breastfed for five years, so they are more natural. This is the resourced world to what we do today. Well, our young women have their monarchy at 10 and they have a period of adolescent sterility. And then after that, they would have a period of um, a cultural infertility. And then they may get married. They may not get married. They may have a child. They may not have a child. And by the time they get to the age of 50, they will have maybe had one or two children. And by the time I don't not sure if you can make that go on, um, uh, any more, Nevin? Maybe not. Uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, the bottom line here is, guys, that with the the hunter gatherers, they have about uh, there we are. So the hunter gatherers, they have um, about um, five children, and they have 50 periods in their whole life. The Mennonites have. 11 children have 150 periods. And we, our young women today, may have one or two children, but they'll have 450 periods. So the question is, which is natural? That is the question, which is natural? And you would have to say, really, the Kung Hunter gatherers, the five periods, and sorry, five babies and 50 periods, is maybe more natural than the resourced world of two babies and 450 periods. In fact, in nature, incessant ovulation is not required. Incessant menstruation is not required. Incessant cycling is not required. Next slide. PMS, polycystic ovaries, endometrius, endometriosis, infertility, cancer of the uterus are all increased in the last 70 years. And breast cancer, could that also be associated 
with an increased number of menstrual cycles? Next slide. Meanwhile, you'll be glad to know that the gynecologists we used to belong to this um, the College of Surgeons. Next slide. And now we belong to the physicians. As for our future direction, well, it could be holistic, it could be psychotherapy, it could be mindfulness, it could be placebo. Let's look at an interesting way a gynae problem was sorted out in biblical times. From St. Luke, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So perhaps these nurses from the 19th and 20th century were onto something. So are women at last getting there when it comes to sexual and reproductive rights? I think it's a bit like the curate's egg. We're sort of getting there. I'm afraid you've got a bad egg, the right reverend host says. New curate says, oh no, my lord, I assure you, some bits of it are excellent. The Native American Indians were asked at the end of the last millennium what their verdict was on the two to three thousand years of males dominating and ruling the world. Three thousand years of a great patriarchal experiment. They called it Kuanis Quatsi. It's been a time of continuous testosterone driven wars, huge misogyny, ubiquitous moral corruption and widespread abuse of the environment. It's been 3000 years of males dominating and ruling the world, 3000 years of a great patriarchal experiment. And as I say, they called it Kuanis Quatsi. Life is out of balance. Meantime, it may be useful to ponder that they themselves were all but wiped out 500 years ago when they were invaded not by Mexicans or Asians, but by Europeans and direct descendants of the likes of myself. Was it all meant to be male dominated? These are my final words on religion. Was it meant to be like this? At the time of the birth of Jesus, we were already a thousand years into the great Abrahamic patriarchal experiment. Women were not in a good place. A woman's testimony was not trustworthy. Judaism prevented women from learning the scriptures or even leaving the household. Even if you've listened to nothing in the past hour, please listen to this. The Bible was written four centuries after the life of Christ. And there is now very good evidence that the men that wrote it airbrushed out of the narrative the woman involved with Jesus and the early church. Dr. Ali Katutz from the Wingard Institute in Holland says this art from the 4th and 7th century and hidden in Vatican until very recent times reveals that in Christ's early church women were in leadership roles. They were priests and bishops and were an integral part of the church. Here we see at last solid evidence of women depicted on the altars of the fabric of the churches themselves. St. Peter's in Rome, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Amazing, isn't it? Sadly, not only were women apparently banished out of the narrative of the first four or five hundred years, but then quite simply pushed out by men of the first of the next 1500 years that takes us to today. Women have been vanquished from leading roles in most churches and certainly all the big ones for 2000 years. And more yet, there is much evidence, as I say, hidden in the Vatican and elsewhere, that women were an integral part of Christ's early church. I do hope you can now see where the ground was prepared for the seeds of Me Too to germinate and flourish. Pope Francis was a great man, a great compassionate man, is a great compassionate man a man of the people, the pe people's pope, some people say. He changed the church law to explicitly allow women to, more, to do more things during mass while con 
continuing to affirm that they cannot be priests. But he wasn't really a true reformer. Advocates for expanding the diaconate to include women and in doing so would give women greater say in the ministry and governance of the church while also helping address priests is really done in several parts of the world because of a shortage of priests. That, it has to be said, is not really the true reformer that the church needs. Next slide. The good news is that changes are occurring. Islam have just appointed Zara Muhammad, the first woman, the youngest and proudly Scottish leader of the Muslim Council of, of Britain. One last woman to tell you about, my mum, a deeply Christian woman who rose to be president of the Irish Methodist Women's Association. My first wife died at age 50 and I was fabulously fortunate to meet, fall in love and have, lo and have that love reciprocated eventually by Samina. Samina was from an Islamic background, but like myself, prefers to declare as spiritual nowadays. My mum was very keen to embrace her into the family and asked me about Islam. I said, well, you have to believe that there's one God and Muhammad is a prophet. She said, well, I can do that. That's easy. And I said, you know, interestingly, they believe that Jesus was actually put on the cross, went to heaven and is coming back again. She said, well, that's the same as we believe. And I said, well, yes, but they believe that he just was put on the cross and went straight to heaven. He didn't die and then rise again. And my mum, always wanting to be helpful, said, well, I mean, that's a sort of a technicality, isn't it? Well, you know, I think of all churches need to relook at what they really stand for, go back to their roots and try and build bridges instead of walls. Can you believe it that there are 34,000 Christian dominations alone? By the way, not one of them run by a woman. Religion is not to blame, just the men who have been controlling them for tens of thousands of years of matriarchy, followed by 3,000 years of the patriarchal experience. It's time for the pendulum to move to the centre. Patriarchy has had its chance and blew it. Sigmund Freud asked woman, what does she want? Well, what does she want? She wants to have equal rights, to be treasured, and she wants education, and she wants control of her own fertility and sexuality. She's climbing back up. Yes, they are. But they need help to reach the summit. Again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jim, that, for that thought provoking uh, presentation. Um, we're running out of time somewhat, uh, so I would uh, turn over to Professor Walsh to maybe moderate one or two questions before we have to close the session. Professor Walsh. Jim, I thought that was a fantastic talk and uh, provocative and insightful and on a subject that you're obviously very passionate about. Um, I recently read um, a book by David Attenborough's most recent book, uh, Life on Our Planet. And he, it's a frightening book because he sets out that we're on the edge of the sixth extinction. Life will continue, he, he proclaimed, but probably without humans unless as he said that we are the last generation that can prevent, prevent it, but only if women are educated and in co-charge. Yeah. So it's it's it really is a you know a, a, a subject which we have to urgently address. So if I was to ask you one question, how how would you fast track it if you um, had the power? Is there well, any? I think, I mean, it's, I mean I, um, apart from what he did in Iraq, Tony Blair was right. He said, education, education, education. And there is no doubt that if we just had education uh, for women everywhere, and I, it was such a joy to come here to RCSI and see so many uh, brilliant young men, but also brilliant young women. And it's a joy to see that. Um, um, so, yes. Uh, I think medicine's important, but I think education's more important. 
just to pick you up on one um, sort of biological issue, you were talking there about, you know, um, the number of menstrual cycles and that probably leads to ovarian cancer, breast cancer, etc. And do you think that, you know, hormonal manipulation is something that should be embarked on as, a, you know, well, I, yes, I do. I mean, I agree it's controversial to say it and not all women need it or want it or anything else. But if we were going to mimic nature, then we should have a situation where women do not menstruate so often. We should have a situation where women do not ovulate so often. And we should have a, a situation where they spend the major part of their reproductive lives um, with very few episodes of ovulation and very few episodes of menstruation. That would be more natural. So I'm not going to sit here as a man and say that there should be manipulated. But until such times as evolution catches up, I certainly don't think we should have any problem in manipulating it to make it more natural until such times. The other, of course, the other big one that I have to throw at you is that women are living so long now that for the first time in the history of womankind, they're living longer in a period of uh, in their non-reproductive phase than the reproductive phase. So they're going to go 40 or 50 years after the menopause running without estrogen. And that's a big discussion to be had because it'll take a while for nature to catch up with that one. And you know, just one final thing the thought occurred to me that, you know, and you made reference to evolution and uh, et cetera throughout. Uh, and of course, evolution is slow. Was there some evolutionary event an evolutionary glitch that occurred about 3000 years ago that put men into that role or was it purely a culture of work? It was purely the invention of the bicycle. It was, um, in other words, it was transport. Men from the Eastern Europe moved over towards the, what we call the Holy Lands and where we are situated now. And they weren't very happy with um, the worship of, um, of goddesses. And uh, so it was a testosterone driven situation that started the whole process. I mean, we can talk about religion after that, but it was, um, men didn't like what they saw. <laughs> thank you. On, thank on you. that note, I'll hand you back to Professor Martin. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Tom. And, uh, and Jim, what a stimulating and thought provoking talk indeed. Uh, I hope that people leave uh, and somehow uh, reevaluate things and think about things in the, the very, Provocative thoughts that you I know, have. Provocative, but I hope I didn't. I, no. I, I think I don't think we 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 went over the barrier. Bar I, I, I was looking it. for the woman, looking for the for the lady with the stethoscope, but I think they yeah. were hidden there somewhere. So I just thank thank everyone for for joining us this evening, and just point out to you the the range of topics that we plan to cover in the next few weeks, and hope that you can all join us. And thank you once again to Fauzia. Uh, Victoria and Celine and uh, Nevin for their technological help this evening. Uh, thank you very much and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much.